welcome to Metal Now. I'm very excited to have my guest, Greg Weeks of The Red Cord and of Sexless Marriage. How are you doing today, Greg? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Of course. I'm, I'm excited to talk to you today because um, you've got a new album coming out uh, and actually it's already available for pre-order, which I think is really amazing. So we'll talk about that today. But before we do, I really want to know, um, when did you first become a serious fan of music and what were you listening to? Uh, well, at a very young age, well, I grew up in a house where <clears throat> music was adored. Like we, at night when we ate dinner, we ate dinner as a family. Uh, my father put on classical music, so we had to listen to that while we ate, which as a kid I hated, but uh, came to love it, absolutely love it. And I think it's probably just from all those nights of eating pork chops and chicken and Bach and Beethoven and, you know. My father made it a point every night to listen to classical music while we ate. Um, but yeah, just through his record collection, he and my mom had a record collection. So even at a very young age, I remember pulling in a chair from the dining room into the listening room and walking over and picking out uh, Kenny Rogers' greatest hits, putting it on, pulling the chair over and just sitting in front of the speakers and listening to it and then flipping it over and listening to, you know, side B all the way through, um, that was probably my first real memory of music. And then my father would, he played, he had a band in college, but he had this nylon string guitar, which had, you know, the action was this far off the neck. The neck was huge. And he would play Beatles covers every Sunday uh, after breakfast. And all the kids have this memory of him attempting to remember the key of Penny Lane. Mm -hmm. So whenever, even to this day, if he sings anything, we all will go, Penny, Penny, Penny. Penny, he was attempting to find the key and we would die. It was like the funniest things to us <laughs> ever is my dad attempting to find the Penny Lane key. And by the time he found it, we would all have left the table at that point because it took him so long. But uh, yeah, I just grew up around a ton of records and, uh, and, and people who loved music. And so I always kind of had that in me, I guess. And then around 10 or 11, I asked for a guitar because I was playing my dad's, so but it was gigantic. And I got a little electric uh, applause. It was like a Strat ripoff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the action on that, I knew nothing about guitars at all. It was probably this, this far off the neck. So I had to learn how to play. And with the action, that was basically Jay Maskus action from Dino Jr. His is way off the neck. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually I got a guitar where it was closer to the neck and I could play a little bit. But yeah, yeah just grew up around it. So when you started playing at 10, were you still listening to your parents' record collection? Or had you started listening to, let's say, maybe other bands that maybe weren't part of their collection, but that you were discovering on your own? Yeah, all right, a little later on, around probably around 11 or 12 is when I would, like my dad was a big blues guy. So he would show me, you know, Danny Gatton and Buddy Guy guitar solos. And I'd be like, that's cool now listen to you know this Dave Mustaine solo so didn't really like the stuff I was listening to but he would sit and listen to what I was playing him to try to appreciate the you know musicianship of it so that is that's probably the age where I got into a lot of like punk and metal probably because it was something that they didn't like <laughs> that's always the way but uh yeah yeah so around you know 11 12 I think I heard puppets for the first time, um, Ramones, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and then a little later, my sister went to college and she brought back like a pile of records and CDs, which was, you know, Dino Jr. throwing muses, Black Flag, that kind of thing. And it just, it kind of blew my mind at that point. So um, you were pretty young when you started discovering the heavier bands, like. Yeah, yeah, my, my cousins were older than me and they kind of made me a mixtape when I was a kid because whenever I'd visit them, they would have these giant maiden posters and I'd see this guy, Eddie, and it would scare the hell out of me. Eddie yeah, thing? Yeah. Oh yeah. my God. You know, <laughs> the trooper and everything like that. And Eddie looked, it was like the coolest mascot ever. And so they made me a mix cassette with like maiden, priest, Aerosmith and stuff when I was young. And so I kind of picked up on that. And then my friends started getting into death metal. So then probably around 14 or 15 I'm listening to Morbid Angel and Cannibal Corpse in my friend's basement um and my parents really hated that so <laughs> so I knew it was good 
So you knew it was really, really good. It was really good. <laughs> and were you, I imagine that being a guitar player and having picked that up already, that you were trying to like mimic um, those sounds that you were hearing from like death metal as well as like more straight metal. Yeah, at first, in all honesty, I didn't know how they were making a lot of those sounds. You know, it was trying to watch videos because as you know, back in the day, you had to actually stay up until Headbangers Ball came on to record videos on your VHS so you can rewind them and try to learn the riffs and everything. Yeah. You know, I remember when Death's Philosopher came out, um, the single came out on MTV. I, I, I recorded it and rewound it, played it a million times so I could at least try to figure out that beginning riff, which is incredible. It's incredible. You but, know, I, I just want to point out, because I, I imagine that the audience is comes from all different ages. But for anybody you're in my age, you and I are East Coasters. So when we were watching Headbringers Ball, which I did religiously, like I don't think I ever missed an episode, but we were watching it from midnight to three in the morning. Yes. Yeah. Just, just to remind you, because I think I think maybe on the West Coast, they were watching it from nine to midnight. I don't know if, or if maybe they had to wait, wait till midnight too. But I know we had to wait till midnight and I think it was, I don't know, in my house, it was kind of a big deal. I mean, I still did it, but my parents weren't thrilled that I was starting to watch a show at midnight and staying up late. I think at like, there was a certain point where it was like, go to bed, go to bed. Oh, yeah, we would, I remember I would sometimes just sneak down or they would go to bed and just say, you know, at 10 or whatever and say, okay, make sure you're up in a half hour or something. I'd be like, you got it. And I'd just stay up all night downstairs yeah. with the VCR ready. Yeah. To like, you know, record the new Rollins band song or something, I, you know, or they'd always say they're premiering something like the premiere of the new Alice in Chains. I remember when I think Them Bones came out, I was freaking out and I had to, uh, I had to record that and try to learn it. Yeah. But, you know, you're trying to watch their hands in a video, which is pre-recorded, so it makes no sense. It's not like it's live, but, you know, that's what I did. Well, and I th I've heard a lot of musicians did that. And it's, it's really always interesting to me because... You know, I remember being there, I would sometimes I'd record the whole thing and sometimes I would just stand there until my I knew my video was coming on and record it and then yep. stop at the right time. And I had literally, I still have a big box. I don't even know if they play anymore, but literally I had boxes and boxes and boxes of six hour tapes because I was too poor to do the two hour better quality. So yeah. every tape yep. six hours. And they each had like like I don't even know how many three minute videos on them but it always blows my mind because I would watch those videos again and again but I'm looking for like stage moves and stage clothes and stuff because I'm more watching as a fan so I'm always I'm thinking like you guys like if you're trying to play a guitar riff and you know maybe the guitarist is the focus during the solo but the rest of the time the camera's on a million other places or a million other people so it always blows my mind that people did that back then and because we didn't have YouTube and like you know, there were some instructional videos, but I mean, I imagine that you were in the same boat I was in of, you really had to save your money. And then you had to decide, do I buy an album? Do I buy a poster? Do I buy my magazine? Do I, when you're older, do I go to a concert? So it was really like, you know, those instructional videos kind of existed, but it wasn't like you could just go out and buy all of them. Yeah, I, I never bought an instructional video and it was mainly because I would spend my money on records and CDs, like that's it. I was, uh, when I really got into it, I asked my parents for lessons or, or they probably suggested and said, if you're really gonna make this much noise, you should at least know what you're doing. And I, <laughs> and I got lessons from a, you know, uh, our local teacher, this guy, Paul Doolittle, and he would, you know, he would teach you whatever you wanted. So he, had a, he has, has an incredible ear. So I would bring in songs and he would write them out for me. Cool. So if I couldn't figure it out for myself, I'd bring it to him and he could show me, you know, just how wrong I was with what I thought it was. <laughs> and then he, he, he actually taught me theory so that when I went to college, I studied music in college. Awesome. Um, the first couple of semesters were a breeze because I already knew all that theory. And then we got into more difficult stuff. And maybe I wish that uh, I had him teach me more. But <laughs> So you and I both grew up in Massachusetts. Did you have music theory classes in high school like I did? Um, I, I was in band, um, so we did, yeah, I had to take music theory in band, yeah. Yeah, I took theory, I mean, it was a very small class, very few people, it was literally, I think, all metalheads, except for, like, <laughs> one or two kids that weren't metalheads, but pretty much everybody else was, um, 
but so it was interesting. And I think we were lucky that we had those because some schools don't have like any kind of music program at all. Um, so I always wondered, did, did you really translate what you were learning in class when you were in school to what you wanted to do as a metal player? Or was there sort of a separation? Wow, that's a good question. I um, No, I think, well, I started playing music in the fourth grade, not with guitar, it was, uh, I played saxophone. Mm. And so I had to learn all the theory starting in fourth grade, which I think it helped because it's almost a whole other language. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I was thinking, I still to this day, I don't really think of what I'm playing, but I definitely think that all that theory has helped me as a writer because mm -hmm. I don't think that the more you know, the less creative you can be. I know sometimes that's a theory of, well, if I know what I'm doing, how can I be creative? Because then all the dots connect and it just becomes math. Uh, for me, it was, you know, I'm, I'm not so much thinking of theory when I'm, when I'm playing or when I'm writing, but it is something I'm very happy that I know how to do and I'm knowledgeable about. Because um, it can get you out of any ruts. It'll kind of jar something loose every now and again. But, but no, learning it didn't really, I think, affect any of my writing or anything but but it is fun to know like a great it turned out to be a great tool for you that you're glad that you have oh huge yeah huge yeah. so what is it i see i know you as a bass player um but your first instrument was guitar and that's what you're doing again so what was it that made you choose guitar when you first started uh not so much first started playing an instrument because obviously it wasn't your first instrument but when you first kind of like asked for an instrument with this sort of intention of playing a certain kind of music? I think it was just like my dad's guitar was all around and I was so curious that I, you know, just picked it up one day and I think he saw me picking it up and, I, and he almost, I think, pushed me in that direction maybe because he wanted someone to uh, teach him what key Penny Lane was in finally or something. But... <laughs> Did you ever teach him? <laughs> uh, no, I think he, I could still, you know, hear him at his house right now just singing, trying to find that key. Is this going to happen on Thanksgiving and on Christmas? And oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll have to hand him a guitar and see if he can do it. I mean, there aren't that many keys. I don't understand. But, you know, and his range isn't that high. So it's only so far he could go. But uh, no, I was just watching him growing up. I was always a fan of the guitar. And, you know, he always played a lot of guitar heavy music in the house. And so to me, I just thought it was cool. And I mean, who doesn't want to play rock guitar? Right. When, um, when did you pick up the bass? It's a funny story. So I was, uh, actually not that funny. Don't you hate when people say that's a funny story and it's not <laughs> funny at all. We'll make it funny though. Yeah, we'll, make, we'll add in some laugh tracks or something. Um, <laughs> so I was working in a record store. Uh, I wanna say at the beginning of, of college or at the end of high school or something around that age. And one of my buddies uh, played drums for this band called Beyond the Six Seal. They had just done a record and he and I've been playing in rock bands I'm playing guitar and like rock and metal bands around the area and he and one day at work he just said hey listen um our bass player is leaving the band we're doing three shows and then we're quitting I know you don't play bass do you want to play bass for these shows and I'm down to play any show ever like even to this day yeah um and and he's like oh, okay fine we'll do I'll do three shows why not so I borrowed their bass player's equipment or someone's equipment and showed up and did these three shows. And that turned into my first tour. Cause then we did two weeks U S and then we did a month in Europe um, where, and that band was playing with a band called the red chord and the red chord, when they got back from Europe, lost their bass player and their drummer. They're like, I'm leaving. Oh, wow. They kind of like a tumultuous relationship so much so that the, Beyond the Six Steel drummer and I on that tour would always talk about how, because they shared members and he and I were the, I think the only ones not in both bands. Yeah. And would always talk about uh, what a pain in the ass it would be to be in the red court because these guys just yelled at each other all the time and didn't get along. And that is so you know, funny. And then we that got funny. home. Yeah, <laughs> see, that is funny. And then I ended up joining the red court. So it was just through just saying yes to things, honestly. It's like, if you want to play the show, I do. Next thing I know, I'm in um, a band that's, you know, doing something. And that in turn led me to be in a band that was really doing something. Right. And so I also then ha had to, um, my first record with the Red Code, I didn't feel 
like I was a bass player as much because there are people who are bass players like that is their instrument they approach it I think in a different way and it wasn't until the second record that I was on that I really felt like okay I'm listening to things in a different way and I'm going to make you know focus on the movement of the song as opposed to just trying to hit whatever notes everyone else is. Yeah and I definitely wanted to talk to you about that because I I feel like that's somewhat I'm going to say a sensitive topic because I think that a lot of bass players do become bass players out of either necessity or opportunity in your case. Somebody who's just like really passionate about playing and is like, yeah, of course I'll, you know, play those shows. And little did you know that you would end up playing bass for a while after that. But what was that like for you? Like, did you feel, was it, there's like, um, I don't mean to over exaggerate or put words in your mouth, but was there sort of an awkwardness of like, I'm playing an instrument that's roughly shaped like the instrument I've been playing for so many years and now I have to make it do something. Like what, what, what was that like to just kind of be handed bass and like be put in front of an audience and, you know, do these shows in front of all these people? Um, for me, I don't think I really thought about it that way. The, the songs I was playing in the beginning were songs that were already written. So I had, you know, I had someone saying, you know, I'd listen to the record, be like, okay, this is how it goes. I can do that. And it, it, again, it wasn't really until I started having to, to write things to music that I hadn't really written before. Like, um, like Mike's from the Red Chord, his guitar playing is phenomenal. And the biggest challenge is to hear him play something that I don't think anyone in the world can play and then saying, okay, I have to write something that makes sense with that. I can mirror it, but I'm not that good. Or I could cover up the fact that I'm not that good and write something interesting. <laughs> so it was, I think it was less of like, you know, oh man, I got to play this different type of instrument and more of like, oh cool, I'm going to play a show, cool. which just led me to then, you know, to where I am now. But there was that along the way, that thought process of, okay, I, I have to approach this differently than I would if I was playing, you know, an instrument that was, that's, littler with two more strings mm -hmm. i had to kind of learn what its job was in the band and that's to hopefully lock in with the kick drum and not get into <laughs> anyone's way you know <laughs> um so it sounded like when you got into the second album and you were writing in that that it became you you approached it a little bit differently it felt more comfortable is that when you started to feel like a bass player yeah yeah i definitely think so Yes, that's when I knew at that point that, you know, I can do this and I feel like I am a bass player. I understand what my job is in the band and what is going to make the song um, a song. You know, what can I what can I do in this band to make the song better? And so it was kind of that that approach that then really led me to start thinking about the bass player in me, like the, the bass line. How is this going to move the song along? Um, but yeah, and since then, I'm pretty comfortable now, I guess, with it. <laughs> it's been a while, right? <laughs> it's been, been a long time, yeah. And I have, um, I've seen like the, the bands that you've been in. You've also, you've gone back to guitar, I think, one other time. I think you, I'm going to say you played guitar and sang in another band. And then did you go back to bass after that? Yeah, well, it's kind of, it's funny. I've, I'm constantly writing and recording and in certain bands. Uh, and the, there are bands that actually put stuff out and do stuff, and then there are bands that I just do for fun. So I'm kind of constantly playing both and playing a bunch of different instruments. Um, and then when either I feel inspired to actually go for it or something is good, good to me enough to share with people, then that's whatever that is, whatever I'm playing at that time is the thing that I wanna push ahead. But um, yeah, so I do go back and forth. like right now i'm playing guitar in a band and i don't think i've picked up the bass um in a couple months so it is weird i do go through like phases of stuff it all depends on what i'm writing for and what band i'm playing in yeah um is it important to you to play a lot of different types of metal because when i was looking at all the bands that you're playing in they're they all tend to lean heavy on the heavier side, but they do kind of have um, different labels. Like they can be defined a little bit differently. Some are a little bit more punk and some are more black and what have you. Has it been important to you as a musician to play sort of different, I'll call them subgenres of metal, or is it really more what you're saying of, 
you love the opportunity of playing you love playing with different people you like just have like having a lot of things going is was it intentional to play so many different types of metal or is it more like go where the music takes you well it it's uh it, you know i've never even thought of this this is a great question too um i feel as though i think i i i will always lean in a more aggressive style uh, I do have projects going on that aren't that aggressive and, and stuff, but I, as far as things that I, I go full force on are, are going to be more aggressive. And I do feel that if I'm playing with the, in the same, you know, genre, if you will, that not that it'll ever get boring, but I always tend to feel that there's, there's more out there. Like, what could I do if I was doing this? I mean, when Red Chord kind of stopped touring as much, I joined a band and, you know, and I'm playing a, a note uh, a second in that band. Everything's kind of going off the rails. And then I joined a doom band where I play a note every, you know, 10 minutes. So mm -hmm. it's, it's fun to see what is out there in all these genres. I mean, they're still aggressive. <clears throat> they're still heavy. But there's, you know, so it's, I'm comfortable with that. But you're getting different things out of it. You know, different feelings and emotions if you will and you can approach it differently as well do you as a performer feel that you are different on stage depending on what type of metal or what type of music you're playing or do you find that because most of the bands that you play tend to lean aggressive that your stage presence and performance are pretty similar um i feel as though and i don't know how many other people feel do this but for me, I think I have not the same moves depending on the songs, but I feel like there are certain things in my mind that I know I'm able to do while I'm playing. It's it's this is such a weird concept to talk about, but I feel as though, you know, in some music it's more fluid, so you're feeling that way to move your body. And in some ways you want to move a certain way, but you have to get through this next passage first before you can even do anything. So I feel for me it was almost song for song how I moved. So it doesn't really depend on what genre, it just depends on the feeling of that song, what I'm feeling at the time. Um, so I, th I think it's more of like a song thing even than a, than a band thing. And is that the same for you between guitar and bass? Yeah, I think, um, I think I move less playing guitar. Oh yeah? Yeah, because I feel like um, my mistakes are easily covered up playing bass. <laughs> 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 so you could do whatever you want <laughs> i could just jump around like an idiot <laughs> oh, that's funny no i always wonder that because i feel like there is sort of a bass player stance like not everybody has it but there's like that certain like pose that i think a lot of bass players have so i always i'm always impressed when bass players can move like really well because some of them just have that more classic movement whereas guitar players i feel like you see them do you know there's people who just stand there there's people who like things and oh yeah and all that, and you know? they, guitar players want to be seen too that's the other thing. bass players just want to have fun <laughs> guitar players want to be seen well i think that's why i was asking i was wondering like are you more flashy when you play guitar or but it sounds like you move more when you um yeah when i play bass definitely i mean i i just want to uh i'm a middle child i've got two sisters so i was the only boy so i clearly am doing all this for attention so if i'm on stage you know, you've got basically four guys fighting for attention. Amazing. Lorraine Lewis said the same thing. She's one of six. And oh, I, that's asked right. her, yeah. I asked her, um, you know, what made her want to be a singer? And she's like, attention, <laughs> which I think is exactly. a valid reason. I think it's, a, especially if the rest of us get to enjoy it while you get your attention. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And I will say myself included, but most of the bass players I know, I mean, our only goal while we're on stage is to basically look like Dee Dee Ramone, so. This is probably true of everybody. Basically start there and then we'll see what develops, you know. There you go. Um, so in you've played in so many different bands and <clears throat> one consistent thing that I've noticed is that Mike Gunface McKenzie has been in many of those bands with you. Um, I By my count, there were four. Um, is that, does that sound right to you? Yeah, it's probably, it's, honestly, it's probably a lot more. I mean, he did a, he has been um, connected to just about everything I've done. There's only, actually I'll say, there's only two bands that he's not in that I'm in. So every other band that I've done, you know, whether people know about it or not, he's in, involved in. And um, even if it's a live thing, I mean, with him too, he's got a band that he plays everything in. 
uh, stomach earth, but when he plays live, I play bass for it. And in fact, the, the last show that Stomach Earth played, it, it was a band for a while. And then we got it down to what he calls the brain, which is this thing that, that has backing tracks and drums and everything on it. And it was just he and I on stage, him on guitar and vocals, me on bass, and then the brain. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> we're uh, and we just always end up, I think, together. In like, bands, we're like Bert and Ernie. You're just yeah, so yeah, we're definitely Bert and Ernie. <laughs> <laughs> How did you guys meet? When did you start? When did you meet? And when did you start working together? We met because he sings for <clears throat> uh, Beyond the Sixth Seal, which is the band that I joined when I was working at the record store. And I distinctly remember meeting him because he his voice. He's got probably one of the de best death metal voices of all time. Um, him and maybe Nate Johnson from Deadwater Drowning. Those guys are they're probably tied. But he showed up to practice. We had rehearsal, and I had not met him yet. Uh, I think I went to see because he was in he's in Red Chord too. So uh, the drummer of Six Steel and I went to see Red Chord, and I was like, okay, these that's the kid that's singing for Six Steel. Okay, this is cool. It was a great show. Whatever we um, you know, and then finally went to practice. He showed up. <clears throat> And I heard the record, so I was thinking, oh, I wonder what kind of effects he has. I wonder what he's going to bring with him. I can't wait to see how he makes those noises. And um, he shows up with this, just a microphone, and we plug it into this old shitty PA, the casino. It sucked. Mm -hmm. And we started playing, and the, the voice that came out of him, it's like inhuman. And I was just... I don't know why I expected he was singing through anything. It was, it's just him. Uh, and, and then, you know, we, we're in that band and we toured together. We're in Red Court and we toured together. So I think just through that, and we also made a ton of fake bands that would open shows <laughs> together. So I think, um, yeah, he and I just kind of connected on music uh, and, you know, just being idiots. And, uh, and we're still idiots to this day. So I think it really worked out. Yeah. So you guys just, you connected musically. Definitely. Yeah. I imagine um, the French there too, if you're, if you keep coming back for project after project after project. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, um, you basically, I always say that bands are kind of the family that you get to choose. Mm -hmm. And then you regret that choice about a month into a tour. So <laughs> definitely a part of a family that I chose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah it's great it's it's he's probably the first guy that I think about if I'm doing a project it's like wouldn't it be fun if Mike was in this because not only do we get to write together which can be you know frustrating and amazing at the same time but we also get to then just dick around mm -hmm. which is also a problem for us trying to stay focused on the project <laughs> at hand it hasn't really kept you from doing work though. I mean, you've done so much work. Yeah, we, <laughs> you either spend a lot of time together <laughs> or you eventually get work done or you're actually more efficient than you think you are. Oh, maybe. The funny thing is if we plan on just hanging out, like we'll say, okay, this day is going to be for writing purposes or, and this day will be for just hanging out. We typically do the opposite. If we, if we know we have to write, we show up and we just blow the whole thing off and eat and just mess around. And then on days where we want to hang out, we show up and then just say, let me show you this riff. And then, you know, six hours later, we have a couple songs going. Well, how's the writing been going during COVID? Are you able, is he like one of your people that you actually are able to see or are you doing like a Skype Zoom type of thing? He and I have um, gotten together probably every other Wednesday uh, safely. And so we're able to, to write and kind of move through things. Um, some of the members of Sexless Marriage are comfortable enough now to actually go to the practice space uh, where we kind of stand away from each other and we're able to, to practice. So he's definitely one of the guys that I see, but it's tough. There's so much I want to do and there's so much we can't do. Yeah. Um, that being said, did, sex, did Sexless Marriage start during COVID or was that a project that you had already started working on before we all kind of went our separate ways? 
it's it, it's so we actually recorded the record right before maybe it was february january or february so it was kind of like like right before right before march was about when yeah march everything kind of you know it wasn't just italy anymore so you know it, it we all had to like go home um but yeah that project was out of the studio by then uh because yeah we were living in in actual life and then <laughs> <laughs> before we came here but uh not like Greg tell me I don't remember yeah I know you guys don't know what I'm talking about but uh <laughs> oh boy but yeah so that was uh, that project kind of uh it's funny Mike's in that as well mm -hmm. and again we were <clears throat> he joined that band because we were driving home from recording another band we're in Umber Vitae we were driving home from a studio it was myself Mike and Chan the drummer from Umber Vitae and the red cord I just work with the same people. I just work with the same people over and over yeah. again. <laughs> yeah, I just like what I like. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it Don't give me anything new. Broke. Like it broke. <laughs> uh, and we were driving back from the studio, and I just said, "Hey, do you guys want to hear some just phone recordings of these songs that I'm I'm doing this band with?" And you know, through the phone recordings, Mike was just like, "This is this is pretty cool." Uh, I don't know if I asked him or he was like, do you have a, you know, do you have a bass player yet? Or I said, oh, I, I know I want this other person for guitar. And I said, do you want to play bass? And he was just like, yep. Usually our conversations with bands go like that. It's like, do you want to be in this project? Yep. <laughs> and we just figure it out from there. Yeah. So um, this new band, is this going to be um, something that will autom uh, automatically be enjoyable by the Red Chord fans? Or is it different? Is it like a departure from that style of music that you were doing with that band? Um, it is, Sexless Marriage is a bit of a departure in that it's more, I'd say, punk mm -hmm. than the Red Chord. Um, but another new band that I, that I have uh, Umbra Vitae is, is closer to the red chord. It doesn't sound exactly like it at all, but it's closer. It actually has three of the four members of the red chord are in it. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Which, I, love uh, that. I love that you all love each other that much. <laughs> we do. It's kind of like, and, it, and it's kind of like we needed a drummer. So Mike and I suggested well, the drummer from the red chord who, uh, I mean, he's phenomenal. He's in a million bands anyway. So, um, yeah, so he was like, yeah, I'm totally down. And so the singer of the Red Quarter is not in it. Definitely texted us after it came out. And he's like, this is really good, but I'm not going to lie to you. I'm a little jealous that you guys are. <laughs> you left him out. Yeah, we left him out. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. So um, the Sexless Marriage album, um, what is it called? And when is it coming out? When is it, is it available for your fans to purchase? It is uh, right now <clears throat> uh, on pre-order through Knighted Throne, and you can get to Knighted Throne through uh, Death Wish, which is uh, the label that Knighted Throne is kind of uh, a subsidiary of Death Wish Records. Mm -hmm. um, and it comes out fully on the 4th, December 4th. Mm -hmm. Pre-orders are now. And... Yeah, it's a it's a self titled record. Um, in my mind, I don't think we'll have any titles for the records, but who knows? We're uh, we're about twelve songs into the next one oh, right nice. now. Okay, you're ready. You're ready to go. <laughs> uh, I can't stop. I can't stop. <laughs> That's awesome. And I saw that you have merch for Sexless Marriage as well, so that fans can can find their way to that. Um, where do they go for that? Uh, they go to. These are all great questions that I. Wish I was more prepared. Oh, sorry. I do. I'm pretty sure you could get through them through your Instagram page for the band. Oh, yes. Yes, you do. <laughs> you can get them through the Sexless Marriage Instagram page. <laughs> I think we have a Facebook as well. Um, I'm really good at promoting myself, just to let you know. So I... You're busy writing songs <laughs> and figure out which members of Red Court are in your current band. <laughs> yes. It's always at least one. You'll know that. It's always at least one. Yeah, I was, I was looking through the list and doing the match and I was like, wow, these guys really like each other. That's cool. So let me ask you one last question then. Um, and I think you you sort of answered this, but it, this thought crossed my mind of 
um, you like doing different things. You like taking different opportunities with different types of metal or different types of music. But do you think this is maybe a function of the way the, the record industry is now of being in multiple bands and trying different things versus let's say maybe a band from maybe before our time because we were kind of kids when when metal had its big moment, but somebody who's like, like a Frank Bellow from Anthrax, like he's pretty much been in Anthrax his whole career until recently when he started doing, you know, more projects. Do you think that's kind of when you came up as a musician of feeling like, okay, this is a better scenario for me is just try lots of different things and like work with different people. <laughs> <laughs> Um, some different people, yeah. Yeah, some different people occasionally um, versus let's say trying to just say invest in red cord and just say, we're just going to keep being the red cord and just keep going under that name. Um, do you think that ha for you, do you think that's more of like because of the way the industry is or is it really just a personal choice of kind of following your heart and what makes you happy as a musician? Well, I think it's at this point a little bit of both. I mean, as a kid growing up, I would always be in any band I could I could be in, whether it was a metal band or a rock band. Um, I was in a band, Cthulhu Ragtime Band, that was just this weird punk disco band. It was just, it had everything in it. I think everyone was just like a big Mr. Bungle fan, so. I just want you to know that's the second time disco has come up on Metal Net. Ooh, all right. Yeah, maybe Sarzo is the other one, but he was talking about like disco disco. Oh, disco disco, like deep yeah. disco. Okay, but yeah. No, like it came <laughs> twice. I'm shocked. It's <laughs> funny. Um, yeah, so I would try, I'd even um, go to music stores in other towns to see if anyone was looking for a musician. And I was in, uh, you know, different bands in different towns in my area. My poor parents had to drive me uh, two towns over to be in a band and everything. So I've always had that mentality of I need to be playing with other people and I need to be playing music that I I love to do but when because you're right it's funny growing up if somebody left a band to start another band or even had a side project it was mind-blowing it's like these people it's almost like are they are they cheating on their band this is crazy you know it's funny because um uh there was another guest I had I think it was Tommy Bolin I want to say and he had been in Warlock and he had, I think, just joined it, if I remember the story correctly. And he had this opportunity to audition for Ozzy. And, you know, and he's telling the story. He's like, man, I really wanted to. But in, in the end, he said, just be loyal to Warlock. And it's funny because we had a separate conversation about it. Like, well, like, what would it have hurt to just, like, try to be in two bands? And he's like, back then, you just totally didn't do that. Like, it's not like now or, or like, you know, your career where you, you can be in multiple bands and, it's really just more interesting. It's like, oh, cool. You know, Greg's in like 32 bands this week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's all good. But yeah, I think when we were kids, like it would have been shocking or like disloyal or just, it just wasn't heard of, I don't think. No, I mean, you know, it, it, it was crazy when, when bands would, you, you know, like when Fight came out and stuff like that, it's like, there's all these bands that kind of, or a super group. Mm -hmm. I mean, I loved when SOD came out because you're like, oh, these are, dudes from my favorite bands making a band but it's, it's a little weird because yeah. they're made up all these bands that I like and it turned out great I mean it's awesome but it is weird back then but now everybody every is, band is a super group now every band is a super band now yeah it's true because people just again it's you know back in the day you were that business entity that was your band that was your money maker or whatever that's how you lived and so I guess it wasn't really encouraged maybe it wasn't uh, not to say it wasn't about the music but it was about the music that you were making that could actually get people paid yeah. nowadays since people can't get paid you can't get paid like, one way or the others why not make the records that you want to make why not be true to what you want to do and explore you know how far can you take it in this band how far can you take it in this band you can never be stale if you're doing five projects at a time that are all different I mean, you can spread yourself way too thin, but you can't, I don't think you can be stale. Right. Well, it sounds like this is, that this path has really been more of a gift for you um, rather than something you feel you have to do. It's like, yeah, inspiring and keeps you like fueled and. Oh, you. definitely. I think that um, the, I mean, who wouldn't love to make their living off of being a musician, yeah. but as a musician, wouldn't you rather explore what you can actually do? 
uh, as a musician and push yourself to do all these different types of things. So again, it would be cool to have a mansion, I guess, but at the same time, I would, I don't think it'd be good for my mental health to play the same shit over and over again, and then give somebody who liked my stuff the same shit over and over again, mm. you know, which I think a lot of bands that became, you know, their lifelong bands kind of fall into that. Not every band, but you know no, what I'm saying? I think you're right. And I think the fans drive a lot of that because um, I'm a huge Pat Benatar fan and she, I forget the number. I think she says like there's the golden 12 or the golden 14. She has a word for it. And she'll even tease the audience. Like you all get mad at us if we don't do those songs. But like, yeah. she's, she'll do them. She'll indulge us because like she has to because she's yeah. like a legacy musician. Um, but she doesn't do all of them if she doesn't want to. So, But yeah, yeah. it's, it's got to be hard for, you know, if you've been playing 30, 40, 50 years and you literally get to play the same five, 10 songs every single oh. night, every time you tour. Um, great for the fans, but hard for the musicians, I would imagine. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's where, where side bands just kind of spawn off of that. It's like, I'm doing the same thing every single night. What if me and some buddies got together and just did this? And then that kind of turns into something. I mean, half the bands I'm in are just people, we had an idea to just do a band and then it happened and we're like, okay, this is pretty good. I mean, Sexless Marriage was just, I was talking with the singer's wife at a party. They had just moved from Austin back to Boston um that, that rhymes that's pretty good uh and and I asked her because he's a singer he sang in a bunch of bands in Austin and I just said how is he doing without being in a band you know because a lot of musicians I know are our, our mental health kind of is connected to being able to express yourself um in that way and and she was like you guys should do something I was like okay and I kind of had that in the back of my mind when I when I was Kind of forming sexless marriage i'm like you know what yeah he and i should do something and it kind of became this band so and i don't think we thought that we would even like do a record and here we are we're about to release a record with all this ridiculous merch and you know we're a band now so it's good keeps you going there you go well thank you so much for sharing you know part of your career and all your bands um with me i'll definitely love to have you on again because i'm sure the next time i talk to you you'll be like 10 more bands <laughs> and 10 more albums to talk about. Um, but thank you for, thank you for coming on. Of course. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Sarah.